Welcome to our session here at CodeSec Days 2024. Uh, I'm Dwayne. I am developer advocate here at GitGuardian, and I am very pleased to be joined by Blake Kaiser from Tenable. Now, I'm not going to read your whole bio out loud here. <laughs> we were going to post that in the show notes, uh, but why don't you give us a quick high level of yourself, a little bit about your background and you know, what do you want us to know about you? Sure. My name is Blake Kaiser, and I've been here at Tenable for coming up on five years now. Uh, I'm a staff information security engineer, but I focus mainly on product security, so making sure we ship secure products. Uh, before this, I've uh, got a, about 15 years of experience in security engineering, and uh, before that, um, about another decade of development. So, Well, thanks for being here. Thanks for being part of this event. So we're here to talk about securing the software delivery pipeline. And I just want to take a few seconds here at the top to level set with the wider audience that's tuning in. Um, at one point, the whole software pipeline was just like two or three steps. You build it and you run it, or you build it, you test, you run it. But we're well past that now. And I know you build a lot of stuff over there at Tenable, uh, at, generally speaking as a company, not just you, <laughs> everybody at Tenable is building a lot of really awesome stuff. Um, but can you give us some insight in what does the modern software delivery pipeline look like? Absolutely. We're well past, you know, just build and run, build, test, run. Uh, you know, modern pipelines are scripted pipelines where you're running on an actual build system. We're not building any software on developer workstations. Um, and we've got tools directly in the pipeline to test for security vulnerabilities. So things like static code analysis tools, container scanners, software composition analysis, API testing, and uh, you know, even before that, we have tools inside of our our SCA for for secret scanning, um, and even post build, we've got you know DAS testing that we're doing um, on on our applications. So it, it's far more than just build and test and and ship. Um, we've got to inspect our applications for vulnerabilities, and um, at times we block our builds uh, if they're carrying vulnerabilities too. So it's all about shipping secure software. And it's a lot of components. It's no longer just, here's the files on my local machine. I'm going to put that on a testing server. Good luck, QA. And then we'll put it on one more place. Hey, how many components would you just guess, uh, or, or pieces, would you guess, like from the a software developer sitting at their terminal to actually in production? How many steps would you just guess an average application takes now? Oh, goodness. Countless. Countless. Um, so, you know, we're, we'll, we'll get into that uh, in a little bit, counting the different steps and, and recording the different steps, but um, is an unmanageable number. You know, it's, it's there's a lot of things that go into building a product like a Nessus um, or, you know, our, our, our IO platform. Um, it, it's a countless number of steps. Um, but I'm curious to what could go wrong with all of this. I, I know there's a couple larger examples out there. Uh, that you've lived through, um, maybe you could give us just a quick high level, like what, what are the, what are the risks here? What can go wrong is, uh, a, you know, a, a supply chain attack. Um, that is, you know, the elephant in the room is, is log for J. That's the one that uh, everybody likes to point to. Um, and, and that incident alone underscores the need for an S bomb in your builds. Um, you know, having an accurate inventory of what's going into your builds at all time and knowing exactly what gets deployed and where um, is absolutely paramount to being able to respond to an incident like this. For us, you know, we'd already been shipping S bombs with every build for at least a year leading up to this incident. So on every build, we attach a, a an S bomb to the actual job. So we have a point in time reference of what actually got shipped when. And we take those results and we ship them to our seam solution. And so when the actual CVE dropped for us, it was a matter of just writing a seam query that says, show me all of the, the builds that went out the door that contained this specific version of log4j. And at that point, it was a matter of just submitting PRs. So for us, you know, we were able to resolve this over, I would say, you know, um, tens, if not hundreds of microservices and have it resolved within an afternoon. And just, oh, just for the sake of any audience member who might not be familiar with SBOMs, we're talking about software bill of material here. Uh, the ingredients list, if you will, on exactly what is in your application. So 
I mean, that, that sounds like ideally what it's for, that something has gone wrong and it affects this one component. Are we running that component? Exactly. Exactly. Gives you that, that visibility into your, your full software stack and lets you know, you know, what, what dependencies you're rolling and where. So S bombs, they sound like a very good idea, but it does sound like a manual idea that you have to keep up with the fire hose of new CVEs and keep up with S bombs because as you're updating applications, you're also updating S bombs all the time. Uh, one of the things I heard in the past year that I really liked is as soon as you print an S bomb, it is out of date. It's just assume it is that that's the S bomb for that point snapshot in time. Um, but we really want to get to something a little bit more automated here, a little bit more holistic looking at what's going on with our applications over time. And that I think is where salsa comes in. Um, the supply chain levels of software artifacts. Um, I'm hoping you could give us a quick insight into that. I know you've been working with salsa a bit recently. Um, and see how does that tie in with us bombs? Absolutely. So, uh, S bombs, they provide a bit of transparency, uh, into your application by listing the different components that go into your application, but that S bomb alone doesn't guarantee trust. It only provides visibility. Uh, salsa takes that a step further by actually recording a, what's called a build provenance. And so that includes like what goes into your application. So your S bomb, but also where it was built the agent it was built on, information about that agent, all of the uh, build steps. So um, as part of your scripted build, it captures each of the build commands and uh, environment variables as well. So everything about building that artifact is included uh, in this provenance. So I like to think of it this way, like say you're baking a cake, right? In the list of ingredients on your recipe card, that is your S-bomb the list of ingredients going into your application, each of the actual steps to prepare the meal, that's the rest of your build provenance. The whole thing together makes that, that entire artifact provenance. So you use the word provenance there. What do you mean by that? So provenance just is an artifact that, uh, you know, just kind of records that build in time, right? So you record that build provenance. And then when you're done with that, you check to see that it's valid. So the, the dependencies that went, that were recorded in the application, did they match what I expect them to be? So you inventory the applications going in and you check to see the, che the hashes of the applications as it was built and make sure that it all matches up. Um, this gives you a certain level of assurance within your supply chain that all of the ingredients going into your application are just as expected. You check the build commands, make sure that those build commands are as expected. Uh, and, and in the end, you know, you're left with an artifact that is um, as assured as you can be, that it is as accurate of an artifact as, uh, as you think it is. And also you've recorded all of the steps necessary to produce that artifact. So it's reproducible if necessary. So it's, it's less about automation of, I have this list of ingredients and I need to go check and see if anything's off on it. And more that the entire process is, you know, that, that kind of like the ingredients list there. It's, 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 um, this is everything we put into it. So it comes down to trust. And that's what it sounds like we're saying here is S bombs are a step into trusting the application, but how do we know we can trust the build process to get to that state? And is this turtles all the way down? At what point do we stop asking the question? Like what point do, can we stop introspection and looking at like what's building the thing that builds the thing that builds the thing? Like how far down does this go? Well, that's the, that's the thing that Salsa is trying to answer, right? Um, by having documentation on your build agents, having ephemeral build agents that don't share workspaces, um, having everything about your build completely documented so that the artifact that you end up with is exactly as you expect it to be. So all of your thumbprints are matching. So you're verifying every single step, every single thing recorded in that provenance is verified as well. And then you create an, what's called an attestation. So you are 
you are attesting to the fact that the, uh, the provenance that you've created on this particular build is not only authentic, it's not tampered with as well. So the, then the customer could take that attestation and then verify the signature of it. So that would be a signature that you would provide. Um, and they would, you know, grab a, a public key and verify that signature. So that's how they could verify that artifact. So Salsa is all about producing the evidence that, hey, we did this in a very specific way. I can attest to this provenance is correct. Uh, but this is putting out output files. Like that's how we're actually dealing with Salsa from a practical perspective. It's just output text files we can scan later uh, to prove and we can sign. Um, I would imagine along the way that there's certain things that would leak into there that you probably wouldn't want in there. Absolutely. So as I mentioned, we're capturing environment variables and all the steps, the build steps to actually build the software. And so, you know, with that statement, there's probably some stuff, secrets that um, could end up getting captured. And so one of the things that we do is not part of the Salsa framework, but uh, one of the things we implemented early on is when we record our provenance, we actually scan it with Git Guardian. And anytime we uncover a secret, we replace that value with a redacted value so that we don't accidentally um, put a secret inside of our provenance. How, I'm just curious, like how often did that happen? <laughs> like, uh, was that literally every environment variable that got called at runtime ended up in a log file? It happens. It happens, sure. When you're collecting that much information, especially when you're getting off the ground with it, uh, it, it absolutely happens. And so, you know, it saved us from rotating a lot of keys. I mean, that brings up a whole other conversation of how do you securely store all of this output? Like storing an SBOM inside of a system that builds SBOMs or storing them alongside your code kind of makes sense. But when we get to this level of, hey, here's the full recipe, 100% true every step along the way. And we might have environment variables in here. Where do you even put that? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's a question that we wrestle all of the time, right? Um, so we generate all of our salsa materials, but it's not something that we're like publicly giving out along with our, our download. I mean, it's available, but it's something we're not distributing. Um, it's absolutely some information you want to safeguard. Uh, for us, you know, we're always wrestling with the question of whether or not this is meant for closed source software. Um, because of the amount of data that you're capturing and you're really kind of putting some of your secret sauce inside of these sometimes, right? So um, yeah, for, for us, it, it, you're right. Um, you know, provenance files are not something that you want to freely distribute. You, you definitely want to keep them safeguarded. We keep them, you know, under lock and key and are backed pretty, pretty strongly. It, it definitely seems like the kind of thing where you want to make that signature publicly available everywhere. Everybody can definitely make sure your, your, your download matches this, but the actual files that back that up, that's a whole, again, it's turtles all the way down with this. All the way down, all of the way down. So that sounds great. The, as a customer, I could just check a signature, basically check a checksum, a hash, like I'm used to that, uh, and say, all right, this is the thing I expected to be there. And it got there in the way that I was told it was gonna be there. Uh, but let's say it doesn't match. Uh, I'm in a situation where, hey, this signature is off. How would that have happened? How what what could have happened to cause that signature to be off? Yeah, that would mean that you have a compromised provenance. So uh, the provenance could be forged if the signature is off, um, or somebody maybe tried to create an artifact as you and uh, uh, put together an incorrect provenance. Um, but that should be a red flag. If that provenance doesn't match, it should be a red flag. Um, and you as a consumer should not install that software. Sorry, I was going to say as a, as a software publisher though, Salsa is not for the weak. <laughs> as I mentioned, you want to verify each and every dependency going into your application. Uh, and depending on how large your application is, think of all of the open source dependencies going into that application. And you have to verify each and every thumbprint each and every time an application is updated, you have to update the check. So you have to update the thumbprint that you're checking each and every time. It is not for the week. It is a, a very cumbersome process. 
Now, I'm curious uh, here, when we're talking about components and these dependencies, how far down the dependency tree are we going? Because as most people at this point are aware, most software is made up of open source components, like 70 to 90% of all the software inside of any release is a third party component someone pulled off the shelf and glued together somehow with their own custom code. Some people write their own custom code for us top, top to bottom, but that's very unusual now. But all those components then are built by gluing together other components off the shelf. And that transversive, um, transitive, sorry, uh, or transitive dependencies. How far down are you checking? For us, we try to do reachability analysis. So whether or not that is a reachable vulnerability, but that's, tr that's a tricky path. That's hard to do uh, within your build pipeline. Um, like you said, it's turtles all the way down because you can go 10, 10 levels deep in dependency. Um, so for us, it's a matter of whether it's practically reachable or not. So a few months ago, you released an article, uh, on the Tenable blog, strengthening the Nessus software supply chain with Salsa. So you implemented this top to bottom for an existing product. I think a lot of people, when they think, well, I'll implement Salsa, you, you think of Greenfield and like how you start a project with this, but Nessus has been going for a while now. Can you just walk us very high level through that process and like what the ins and outs and the Oh yeah, major faced? hurdles. Um, so the thing about the Salsa framework is that it's simply a framework. There's no, there's no tools out of box. There's no button to press. None of that. It is a framework that uh, gives you guidance on how to strengthen your supply chain. And so for us, um, the type of build system that we use in particular uh, is not GitHub Actions, which is what all the tools are available for. And so for us, we had to custom build everything from the provenance recorder down to um, you know, writing our own rules and validating that the provenance is correct and validating our build agents and um, so every single step of implementing Salsa, we had to do everything with manual engineering. There's no, there's no uh, projects available to us. So for us, it was a, a pretty long road um, to, to kind of get it all done. Because as I've mentioned, you know, there's a lot of steps that you have to check and verify. And Nessus is not the smallest product in the world, right? So there's a lot of build steps that we've got to verify. There's a lot of dependencies we've got to verify. Um, so it, we had to get it right. And um, we ended up having a third party come in and validate um, our, our, uh, the way we've implemented the framework and um, has given us an attestation that we've completed Salsa through level three. Uh, this road from start to finish was about eight months. Luckily for us, a lot of the things, um, a lot of things required by the Salsa framework are we were already doing. So as I mentioned, you know, we were already generating S bombs. We already had scripted builds. So for us, you know, when we started it, we were kind of in the middle of uh, like level two. We, we had some of the steps implemented, but not exactly all of them. Um, and so for us, it was a matter of just kind of like filling the gaps of uh, what we weren't yet meeting. Um, but for us, it was about an eight month uh, process to implement for Nessus from start to finish. Now I'm curious, is this something you can just do from the security side and like independently off to the side or is, is there process change involved? Do developers have to sign off on something along the way? Like wh what does that look like internally for the team? Uh, it means that the AppSec teams are working a lot closer with the engineering teams now. So as I mentioned, you verify each and every dependency that goes into the application itself. So every time the application is set to update, um, you review each of the dependencies, get the, the new updated thumbprint of any updated or newly added dependencies, and then you add them into um, the way you, you check it. For us, um, we use a, a rules library that we just, you know, we read the rules and then check to make sure that they're valid against the provenance. So what we recorded, so what we saw in the build. So yeah, we, we do sit a lot closer to the development teams now because we have to have a very good relationship because <laughs> um, otherwise if salsa validation fails, then we fail your build. So this, this seems to really tie in in a certain way to the idea of shifting left and the grand sense that we are moving from the traditional, like, all right, you're done with your job developer. Let's go run this thing 
to, well, security needs to get involved a lot sooner. And I think that's the real definition of shifting left is shifting the security concern as early in the process as possible. So is this impacting like planning for like next phases? Do people need additional requirements that they're signing off on before they can even start something in the backlog? Sure. But it's, it's, it's a culture change. You know, um, once you adopt the culture and you live that culture for a little while, uh, it, it just becomes natural. You become part of the process, but I mean, yeah, it's absolutely, it's, it's difficult to get that foothold, uh, where you're part of the early project planning process. Um, but like I said, once it becomes part of the culture, it's just like riding a bike, you know, second nature. Um, so I want to get back to this idea we, we started with, with S bombs and well now with salsa and this providence of, we know what's there, but what do we do with that knowledge and how do we go from a manual process of, yeah, I can check, I can manually do a checksum. I can manually make sure the signature's right. Yeah. I can go look at this list versus the latest CVE. Um, what's, what's next on this path? What's the, what, what do we do with this knowledge now that we have it? Yeah. So, uh, I think the last few years, the, the emphasis has been on implementing all the tools to catch all the things, right? So running container scanning or software composition analysis or SAST or secret scanning, et cetera. And now you have all of these tools inside of your pipeline and all of this noise. And it's a matter of what do I do with all this noise now? Right? Uh, because not only are you receiving noise, but you have to do risk prioritization. You have to understand, well, what, what of this noise do I need to pay attention to now as opposed to later? And how do I get this in front of the developers, you know, when I need to. And I, th I think that's kind of where the market is going with ASPM tools in, in the ASPM space. <clears throat> and, you know, uh, once you have all these tools, it just feels like a fire hose. I mean, it's a wall of data and these ASPM tools are now just trying to help you figure out risk prioritization and helping you answer that question. Um, but the one thing that, that a lot of the ASPM tools in the space right now are falling short on is that they're not taking into account application inventory side of things. So they're doing a great job at risk prioritization and, and helping you identify what risks need need to be paid attention to however it's not taking into account uh the source of that data about the application so unless your application inventory is crisp and clean and up to date your aspm data is completely out of sync and it it's just you know you don't know how true that data is so if you're in an organization where microservices are reorged all the time that data is going to get out of sync really quickly and you're not going to know how to prioritize that data um, so that's, you know, in a nutshell, kind of where things are right now, we're, we're, we're getting all of these noises in and we're trying to figure out where, what to do, what to pay attention to first, which alarms do I care most about, um, all while trying to keep the, the front of the house clean as well to make sure that application inventory data is accurate, uh, and that I can rely on that to help me with that risk prioritization. So you use a term there, ASPM. Uh, application security posture management. Uh, it's something we've talked about here at Get Guardian on our blog a bit. Um, and we have some partners out there. Uh, if you look through our, our, our website. Uh, but yeah, it's it's that tool that's trying to aggregate all of those alerts, all of those notifications, all of that warning that your tools give you. It's one of the interesting things about security tools is that unlike tools like you know jenkins which you know it's a build tool um a great old build tool um octopus uh a, a deployment tool um like the purpose of a security tool is to give you alerts is to give you alarms uh and keep you safe but also to raise those alarms and if you're dealing with one system it's already a lot but we're not just talking about one system anymore uh, and i think that's what we've really seen give rise to this this notion of well, what's your overall security posture? What do you, I always like to phrase it as, is what do you do next to become more secure? Absolutely. That's, that's the, that's the, the road we're all on, right? We're all trying to answer that question. Uh, and, and, you know, you bring up a, a really good point about, 
uh, different build systems in your environment too, right? That's that's a constant challenge that you're always trying to wrangle because you go through situations like acquisitions where you might you know end up purchasing a company that has a different build system. So that's a new build system in your environment because guess what? You can't always just migrate a build. It does, you don't snap your fingers and suddenly you know your Jenkins build is building on GitHub Actions. So um, you know that's another thing that that security teams are having to take into their account, right? Like. Now you have different build systems in your environment, just another vector. So on the highest level, ASPM, um, well, well, first this is acknowledged that it is a marketing term that came, the Gartner came up with. Yeah. Uh, it's really inherited the legacy of SOAR, of uh, all the orchestration tools, um, all the crazy acronyms. They've got an O in it somewhere, you know, security tooling, uh, I'm not even going to guess an acronym at this point. Um, I'll, I'll probably cut that out. But um, it seems like ASPM is another step toward the eternal chase to get to that single piece of glass, that single dashboard that I can log into and it will show me everything that's wrong, everything that's running, everything that's good, and let me make the next logical decision. Is, is this just another you know, cycle of eventually we get to a point where we aggregate all of our ASPM tools. I sure hope not. <laughs> uh, you know, I think, um, I, I think that the ASPM space has yet to be truly figured out and that nobody has the silver bullet yet. Uh, and I think that uh, if anybody figures out that silver bullet, uh, they'll have something good there because yeah, I mean, ultimately, uh, having strong ASPM, uh, in your environment is, is Zen for product security, you know, as an aggregate tool though, it's only really as good as the things that make it up. Um, like the, the weakest link argument. So if you have a few tools that are giving you bad data, false positives, false negatives, that's going to impact your, your readings from your ASPM tool. Oh, hundred percent. This comes back to exactly what I was talking about earlier with, with application inventorying and making sure that data coming into this is as clean as possible and accurate and up to date, because if it's not, then the data inside your ASPM isn't going to be, isn't going to be very good. So what, what can we do about that? Like, how do we go about fixing our data? Yeah, there's several, there's several open source uh, tools like backstage can help record it. It's a culture thing though. It is a, it's a hundred percent a culture thing, right? Uh, uh, product management, project management, uh, at the engineering level, you know, need to have an ownership in it with CICD teams and product security teams. And it has to be an engineering culture, uh, adoption. Everyone has to own it from, from that perspective, because, if, if everybody's not involved, it's, um, it's going to get out of sync really quickly. So to wrap things up here, thanks very much for being a part of code sec days. Uh, what advice would you give for folks out there who are on the path to one, just adopting us bombs as a standard, but two people that are on that path to get to salsa, uh, at least level one. Don't get overwhelmed. Don't get overwhelmed. It could feel overwhelming, the amount of stuff that you've got to get done. Um, but make increments, you know, uh, start with one project and, and you know, clean the street and uh, then move to the next. Just don't get overwhelmed. Um, you know, there's 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 some open source tools that can help with creating SBOMs now uh, fairly, fairly well. And I would say use them all to your advantage. Well, thanks very much for being here. And have a good rest of the day, everyone, at CodeSec Days 2024. Thank you.